Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new panel um, as part of Makers and Movers Summit. We're going to be talking today about managing logistics costs around the world um, with the subtitle Away from Squeezing Suppliers Towards a Smarter, More Partnership Driven Approach. We have a great panel uh, with us, and I'll briefly introduce them all to you. Um, on one side, we have Gim Siu Ho, who is the head of Group Commercial Strategy and Cargo Solution at the PSA International, Port of Singapore Group. Um, she is responsible for developing and maintaining the overall group business strategy with a focus on major industry trends and potential shifts, uh, and also leads the cargo solution development. Gim Siu, thanks for joining us and a pleasure to have you. Thank you, everyone. Good to be here. Um, then we have Heine Merman, who is the CEO of Orchestra. Orchestra is one of the leading uh, software and technology providers that offers end-to-end -end, uh, supply chain and logistics visibility with a combination of um, uh, technology, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. He has spent a lot of his career in the logistics field, has been with D.B. Schenker for a long, long time, where he was also a board member responsible for the air and ocean freight. And prior to that, he was also the CEO for the Americas. Heiner, thanks for joining us and pleasure to have you. So good to be here, Roger. Thank you. Um, and then we have Rob McIntosh, who is the Senior Vice President for Global Fulfillment, Logistics and Trade at Dell. Um, he has the responsibility for a number of things, including global return, returns and refurbishment operations, software and peripherals procurement, as well as service logistics operations. He's been with Dell for many, many years, close to 20, um, and has worked across several organizations as well as several um, continents. Uh, Rob, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Look forward to the conversation. And Sami Nazar, who is the category head for international transportation at Decathlon. Um, Sami uh, has had a full-time work experience across different uh, geographies, including Lebanon, Egypt, France, now based in Singapore. He is in charge of the overall international transportation of Decathlon, as, as we all know, and we might be wearing or using their products. Uh, Decathlon is one of the largest and fastest growing company in the apparel, as well as sports categories with a 12 billion plus turnover uh, globally, euros globally. Sammy, welcome and thanks for joining us. Thank you, Radu, and thanks for the advertising for Decathlon. My pleasure. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan. I'm a big uh, user. So, uh, you know, uh, my, my big pleasure. Um, so let's start. Um, and, and I'll start with the first question to, to all of you. I'll start, you know, Gims, you, you from the Port of Singapore perspective, but also um, as a group, you uh, own as well as operate terminals, both inland as well as um, at, at sea and oceans ports in different parts of the world. So I'd like to uh, maybe uh, get you to share a little bit your perspective of what's happening. We've had some significant disruptions. Suez Canal is just the last one, right, in a large string. So maybe tell us a little bit uh, of how you see the global logistics and transport map. Okay. Uh, okay, um, good morning or good evening, everybody. Yeah, um, PSA operates uh, terminals, and I think known, not known to many, we also operate the inland terminals. So what we have seen so far, you know, although most of us will still see us as the terminal operator, um, what we are experiencing is really part of the whole and entire supply chains. Um, what it has taught us with COVID and also with the um, uh, ever given at the Suez Canal incident is that it's really important for the port to play a role as part of the resilience of the supply chain. Okay, from our experience and amongst all the terminals that we see, typically we see that the hubs, whether it be gate ports or transshipment ports, are able to absorb such shocks better than the rest because they don't just operate as a hub, as a port, they also have the extensive hinterland that will help to facilitate the connections to onward places. It could be places that suffer from uh, um, uh, uh, the pandemic that could immobilize some of their terminals. And then the hub ports could act as a staging area for some of these cargo before they find its way to the destination. Uh, we also see that with COVID, right, many companies and manufacturers, and I think uh, Dell and uh, maybe Decathlon could also attest to that, are then looking at reconfiguring some of the supply chains. 
right? Um, it, looking at how it could be more resilient, looking at how it could have uh, more sustainability built in. And uh, in our portfolio that we operate, we feel that when it comes to hinterland movement, uh, how the manufacturers and forwarders would choose rail over trucks, uh, we'll look at uh, a more distributed kind of hub concepts. Uh, and digitalization has also been pushed to the fore. And uh, with PSA, where we operate port community system, we are able to also interact better with the users of the port to give them visibility of when the vessels are arriving, whether the goods are moving smoothly, whether they are likely to be delayed. So that goes into a lot of planning for the, for the supply chains and its further resilience. Back to you, Adam. Thank you. Um, Rob, uh, in terms of Dell and, and maybe looking back at some of the practical things that, that you did uh, in managing your logistics network and partners and providers, right? And that worked because so many things that went wrong, right? But I was, I was hoping that you can share some cases or example of things that you put in place maybe 12 or 18 months ago, or even longer, that helped you mitigate and, and, and navigate all this last couple of months of uh, disruption. Sure. Um, you know, the, the, probably the, the benefit that we had or I had is um, in early February, we were getting together as a leadership team um, in Las Vegas and um, uh, Michael was there, but um, he took this, um, I, he, I, that was the first elbow bump I'd ever seen was from Michael. And um, he took this uh, really seriously and pressed us a bit to make sure that, you know, we were healthy and we stayed healthy, but also that um, make sure that the company is strong. Um, and so with that, we actually end up meeting with most of our key logistics partners in that month of February. Um, and so we, what we did is we actually set some guidelines and, and I'll call them uh, rules that we had operate under that gave us some autonomy, it gave them some autonomy, but it was principles that um, we worked through. Now, and with our key providers on our break forwarders, which are ocean, air, and even some of the domestic transport, um, I would tell you that, that um, we, we, we have lived by those rules and those guidelines all the way through the deal. And, and in fact, we're extending contracts right now in the middle of this chaos for um, you know uh, periods of time, 12 months or more in some cases. Um, and it's, I just think that by setting the guidelines up in a, in advance and we played by the rules that really helped us because for us, if you look and say, how do you measure what was successful? We had the most record year we've ever had, um, at Dell was last year, um, by far. And to add to the context in March, um, the fulfillment centers that serve the, about a largest percentage of our revenue, which is in the U S um, uh, three of them were, uh, or four of them were impacted by a tornado in the middle of this. Two of them were completely taken out. And that was like the head, head part of what feeds um, the entire Americas. And so to put that in place and our three PL partners in that case, I would tell you also um, helped us out quite a bit. So we, we actually have really good support from our providers. And I think it's probably through the guidelines that we set up a uh, just as a pandemic was uh, getting started. Mm. Thank you, Rob. Sammy, how, I, I know you, you also have some good stories. Uh, maybe I pass it to you, and then we come to Heiner from a tech perspective. Yeah, definitely, Radu. What I would like to add also is that I have been in the industry for the past seven years, and I have to say that every year has been quite exciting in terms of uh, specialty, novelty, but 2020 has been a completely disrupted year where we can see that from uh, actually buyer market, we have switched to a seller market. And according to me, this is something that is really big in terms of procurement because we are facing now some issue with some capacity. We are facing some issue with flexibility because when you have market that open and close, eventually you will get some big fluctuation in your production. So. This is something that we have to keep in mind and I believe that people have to be agile and maybe to change a little bit their strategy. Uh, saying that, I have to say that we are quite proud at Decathlon because 
uh, one of the big strategy that we have put it in place for the seven years is trying to do some partnership directly with the carriers. So today, 80% of the volumes are done through multi-year carriers uh, contracts. And uh, I have to say also that during this uh, period of uh, big uh, tencent, um, density, the carriers compared to the freight forwarders were much more stronger in terms of being able to uh, provide the service, provide the equipment, and to keep it, the price rate compliant with what was negotiated. So this is something that uh, I wanted to say concerning the uh, strategy concerning carriers versus NVOCC. We do work as well with NVOCC that can provide also some agility, flexibility to switch from one service to another, but this, uh, this strategy has to be appointed. Thank you. Um, Heiner, you guys, obviously you work uh, and, and your technology and software provider that helps companies and manufacturers and shippers at large to minimize costs, to be agile, be flexible. Maybe you can share some examples of some case studies of, of you know, some of the last six, 12, 18 months and, and you know, some good, um, some good stories of how you, how you helped. Thanks, Radu. Um, so COVID for us has been, been, been in incredible uh, on so many, so many fronts and so many levels. Um, I, after a long career at, at DB Schenker, I started orchestra about three years ago and we were, we were pretty successful out of the gate. It took us sort of a year and a half and we had a nice uh, sort of book of business and, and really a nice backlog as well. And um, when COVID struck, some of our customers flourished while others were really deeply, deeply shocked and their business uh, sort of evaporated to a great extent almost, over, almost overnight. And, and for us, this, that meant that almost sort of 40% of our uh, young customer base sort of disappeared over, over, overnight, which was a shock. And the others did did better, and um, as a result, I mean, the core offering that we provide is 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 visibility and digital execution. So the customers that we had on board were way better prepared to really deal with this uncertainty because they had transparency. They were able to react very very quickly and started making making adjustments and moves moves um, that resulted in in a less bad situation for them, but, but everyone is struggling right now. There's, there's, there's no doubt. And I'm also really, I was totally surprised and pleasantly surprised how well the move away from the office worked for, for both the, the service providers on the 3PL yeah, side, as well as, the, as, as well as the, as well as the carriers, um, because Overall, supply chains, um, in spite of the capacity issues, managed to remain uh, remain intact, in and uh, things kept moving. So there was was impressive. The overall move to digitiz digitization was 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 really really impressive. And, and I'll stay with you for a second, Heiner, because on that topic of supply chain digitalization, and they have been a speed up and an acceleration on that in in most uh, supply chain, most companies. How, how how have you observed that uh, that process in the last uh, couple of months? Also, how how do you make it real, right? What are some of the preconditions, especially since you're also dealing as a company with all the chaos that is emerging from all these disruptions? So, supply chain digitization, uh, Radu, is 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 a topic that has been on on the agenda of of, of many 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 companies, but many approached it uh, in obviously in, in in different different ways, and the customers that we we were engaged with, um, we always make sure. We start with the people in terms of understanding what is the level of digitization in the or organization, what are the plans, what are the, what are the aspirations, and really what is possible, and how digital is the mindset of the organization. I think that's 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 the foundation, and then from there you can see what is the appropriate technology that really help uh, help that customers. If you if you over deliver on the technology part, but under deliver or don't pay attention to the human part. Um, in our experience, the results are disappointing. It's, it's sort of an example. If you take Tiger Woods' golf club, 
that doesn't that doesn't turn you into Tiger Woods, right? It's a it's a tool, and you have to have the human capability to leverage the tool. So we spend a lot of time on in, ensuring that our customers' digital mindset is 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 alive and well, and they're ready to use modern 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 tools. And then we take one step after the other. Hey, um, Heiner, I could just comment on to what you said there mm -hmm. that over the last this period here, I think. There's two things that you said I thought were really resonated with us is, you know, that you talked about decision making. Um, I, I heard that come out at the beginning there and fast decision making. That's something that um, I was reflecting on with someone else that really helped us with imperfect data. But the piece that probably helped us with, um, you brought up the Suez Canal earlier with the, the vessel that was had some issues and, uh, um, just throughout this, when all those incidents happened to us and the tornado that hit our buildings, and when there were some partial constraints around the globe where par partial people weren't allowing us to, were putting us on some limits by city, but we had capacity in other cities, we had built some digital tools internally to where we could actually count and we could go see what was in the containers that's in the Suez Canal. Um, we could actually count the number of packages and know when we're going to hit our limits so that we don't have any rollover. Um, we were fortunate for that, but it's, I think to your point where you were going is um, Tiger Woods Golf Club. I, I, the other thing that I think that paid dividends for us is we started working on providers' data quality, and we have a data rubric where we start to measure the data that's coming into our data systems. And you'd be surprised when we were starting out with um, people that you know are running at, I'll say 10%, 12% data completeness and accuracy, but we had gotten it up into about 80, 85, 90% in a lot of cases with the freight forwarders. And that helped us with our tools to where they actually, we were able to, you know, finally use them after we got our, our data quality um, sorted out. That's amazing that you're able to achieve that, Rob. Data quality is a huge topic. And when I was at Schenker, there was something we were struggling with every day. And now from orchestra, I'm seeing the data quality of all the other service providers. And, and some of them are doing well, while others are struggling. But it's, in, it's, it's exciting. I actually could tell you um, privately probably a rating of how I look at the providers and see what you think. <laughs> but Let's, let's um, do that. <laughs> Yeah, maybe don't do it publicly, but yeah, just no. do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, I, I wanted to open up a little bit the discussion also to the, uh, you know, about uh, 12 months ago, we were in the middle of trade wars and tariffs. And I mean, this obviously it's, there's some aftermath even now, but um, have you seen a significant reshuffling in, in and, and you know maybe you know uh, on Dell side on Decathlon also gives you um, in terms of this manufacturing footprints the supply chain networks uh, the way that you know obviously logistics have to operate within those networks or have the last 12 to 18 months not been so significant in terms of those uh, you know reshapings um, maybe I'll, I'll start with you gives you and then I'll move to, to Sami yeah so um uh, where we look at is really for the, from the general trade movements, right? So uh, we have seen that last year, I, I remember maybe about 12 months ago when we first started, and we were doing our projections on the overall volume. We were rather pessimistic given how widespread it was. But I think overall, the year turned out a lot better than expected. And then the anticipated shifts that we saw or that we expected to see that uh, the trans-Pacific trade may decline and maybe in favor and maybe shifting more to regionalization with north-south trades between uh, South and North America or even from Southeast Asia to US, I think those trends were not that evident. In fact, um, from the overall market perspective, we do see trade growing a lot at the Trans-Pacific and also growing uh, a quarter later when the trade rebounded for the Asia-Europe. So largely, that's how the trades are moving. And uh, I also recall that when COVID first started, we thought that, you know, the intra-regional trade will also increase, right? Because there will be a lot more nearshoring. Again, we don't see that very evident. Uh, uh, it is still um, a bit of a muted growth. If there is any big growth that we see in intra-Asia this year, it was probably because of the back, uh, because on a year-on-year -year basis, there was a very low base last year. 
So how what we what we could tell from there, you know, notwithstanding that, yeah, we think that this is still this is these are still the uh, still the effects of COVID, you know, where there is a consumption increase, but it is not necessarily um, uh, supported by manufacturing or or real economic growth, right? Uh, whether there is uh, an increase in capital equipment that are shipped, we don't see it as much. Right, in terms on an overall global basis. Um, we believe that uh, with the uh, supply chains building more resilience, uh, overall, the supply chains will tend to get a bit shorter for more reliability and resilience. And also for sustainability, you know, we do feel that there will be some conversion from air to ocean. Right Now that it has been proven possible, especially over last year, there could also be some conversion from truck to rail, which could make for a lot more of those cross-continent movements. Right. Thank you. Sammy? Yeah, I think this is a very interesting topic because I can tell you that from the production perspective, there have been some concern about the fact that Decathlon was so highly dependent on the Asian country for or manufacturing. So eventually, you know, people start to be scared and to ask themselves if we can have our manufacturing facility that are closer to our Western uh, countries. But very quickly, it, ha it happens to see that this is not so easy to switch and to source from, from day one to another country. And the reality is that there are some opportunities sometimes on local to local market to develop some industry. And this is what we're doing in Russia, in Turkey, in Brazil, where eventually there's a lot of concern as well on, on the legal part and on the customs. There are also some few processes that are uh, able to be switched from Asia to Europe or to America when we're talking about, for example, uh, uh, robotics, low labor in terms of intensity or assembly of bikes that we have in Decathlon. Nevertheless, the reality, uh, Radu, is that the labor cost between a country in uh, Asia compared to the labor cost in Europe and America, we're talking about a ratio of uh, 100 times. So this is one of the concern. The second concern is the raw material. It's maybe easy to produce locally, but nevertheless, the raw materials that you need are also coming from Asia. So at the end of the day, it is very uh, uh, complicated to decide to switch your manufacturing from Asia to, uh, to Europe. But what we believe more is to have a kind of circular economy where we are working more on reducing, reuse, recycle, to give second life products. And this is what we're trying to do as well to make understand the people that maybe there's a different way of consumption and that we definitely have to work on these three R. Um, Rob, I, uh, I dare ask you, I mean, I guess you, you know, you're one of the most complex, you, you manage one of the most complex uh, supply chains, right? You have so many different parts that go into your products, right? So um, maybe share a little bit your views on this as well. Yeah. Um so if I t take the, the whole question, which I'd say it starts about 18 months ago, or I would even argue for us, it started about three years ago or four years ago. Um, due to some of the administration changes in the US, um, we actually made quite a bit of investment in resiliency um, due to, the, uh, frankly, the tariffs. And um, with that, we just, we, uh, that forced us to really think through our supply chain complexity and to your point, it, 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 it can get pretty complicated. Um, with that though, those investments that we made as the pandemic hit, it actually served us really well. Um, and so we had set up some manufacturing uh, capability to where we now have um, any to any um, type manufacturing. As an example, we, we actually used um, our, our Poland factory actually um, served the US market for the products that it serves due to some of the pandemic issues earlier in the, the year um, to offset some of the capacity and vice versa. So that worked out pretty well for us. I would say um, as a COVID hit, um, my boss um, uh, had us meeting every day for three hours a day for about 
uh, it was about seven, I, I think it was about seven, seven weeks um, every morning. And we went through, as you, Ryder, you, you would be surprised that we were getting down to uh, sub-tier suppliers into manufacturing of different components. Like as an example, as one would be a motherboard um, or in other cases, but due to that amount of planning and work that we went through, um, we actually did figure out some gaps that were in our supply chain. And we ended up figuring out in some cases where we were sole sourced um, at, at second tier suppliers by doing some of that work. Um, it, it was painstaking to go through it, but um, that did um, serve us uh, pretty well in terms of dividends and able to, as I mentioned, we had pretty good numbers that we put up, but even more so even, and we also were hit with the tornado in the middle of us. And so that was teaching us even more about resiliency and um, you know where we have our facilities and how close together they can possibly be, whether it's cities, states, and countries, um, and so forth. So um, something even, if I wasn't such a believer in the BCRPs before. We do tabletop exercises and um, you know, I, I do go through that process and have for the last 20 years at Dell, I would tell you now um, the BCRP process and, and, and that work on the whole resiliency side, you know, if, if it wasn't important before, I think everyone probably realizes how important it is and um, doing the work in advance actually, um, uh, you know, pays, pays you some dividends. Um, For sure. Uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to ask also, uh, Heiner, because, you know, Rob, you mentioned about the suppliers. I was, I, I read an article, I mean, there's some serious issues in the automotive and not only in automotive, but there's some, you know, there's some chip shortages that are quite, uh, have quite uh, accelerated in the last couple of weeks. And there was an article on Toyota and, and the way that they managed to preempt this by stockpiling because they could tell, looking at their providers, their suppliers of what's going on, they could uh, foresee that this might happen so they are one of the few automotive companies that are not affected because they have that visibility into the tier one two three suppliers that you know quite frankly as you as you mentioned rob not a lot of people go through that exercise or that discipline or that pain to actually uh, to actually look at it um so i wanted you know thinking from that angle but also at, at large heiner maybe share a little bit also your views on um, you know, on having that, you know, obviously visibility over the network, of, over the providers, over the service um, uh, service providers that you use can help. And, and what's your experience with it? The, um, the, the those are it's essentially two topics, um, rather. One is is sort of resilience, risk management, and so forth. What 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 Rob was alluding to, and that, especially for large multinational companies, that's becoming an ever increasingly uh, uh, in, important, important topic, topic and there's te technology uh, coming on stream that is, is really supporting that, 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 that a lot. And it's really, really important work. Mm -hmm. But what I've seen so far, it's mostly done by large multinational uh, corporation. In terms of visibility, network visibility, supplier visibility, that is enormously valuable. I mean, we briefly touched on it before in the, in the exchange with, with Rob in terms of um, understanding and, and sort of improving data, uh, data accuracy and data compliance. If it's the forwarders, if it's the carriers or wherever else, or the factories for that matter, right? It's, I mean, for, for shippers to get visibility and transparency of performance and cost is an enormous gain uh, because it will drive drive efficiency to, 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 to a great extent and will also lead to opportunities to get to a real life view of what the land cost is, right? And that those are important in regard to pricing decisions for for customers and products and and, and so forth. So visibility is 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 enormously valuable and important to get to. And, and on the topic of, of cost, uh, Sammy, I want to pass it to you. I know that you have some pretty good um, and practical, uh, you know, practical examples uh, and strategies of how you manage to do that and how do you also benchmark your costs, right, specifically for, uh, for logistics to, to tell whether you're competitive versus the market. And, and also I'll open up to those very particular late charges, demurrage, detention that has crawled upwards significantly in the last. So maybe talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I, I think this is an exciting topic as well because 
uh, the, the, the rates in the shipping industry is something that is uh, difficult to understand from a, a production uh, perspective. Very few people are aware that we are talking about a commodity market and eventually for us working in procurement at that time, it's quite difficult to show that eventually we're going to have 100% or 150% increase in our cost in terms of transportation. So definitely I think what is uh, very important is to be able to compare and to benchmark you with your peers in the industry. I see sometimes people that are still comparing their price with the previous year. So I hope that they are going to keep their job because it's going to be difficult for them. So my advice is yes, definitely they need to have some information to be able to benchmark their rates. I have to say that there are basically two options. The first option concern the contract rates that are for a long-term period, which is above three months or six months. And to be able to compare those rates, there are a multiple of companies today that are providing some benchmark. And I do believe that is definitely something that every company should look forward. I don't know if I can name some, some companies. Is it possible, Radu? Yeah. Okay, so today I believe that there is one uh, company that uh, has been uh, working on this for the past seven or eight years. Uh, and it's called Xeneta that is providing some reliable information on benchmarking. So this is for the long-term contract. For short-term contracts, we use uh, to have some data coming from the uh, Shanghai Container Freight Index. But eventually, for uh, three or four months ago, they have decided to stop providing this information uh, for free. So it has becoming uh, something that you need to pay for. And uh, once again, Xeneta, they have been able to provide some free information on their website so that you can have some information on spot trades on the different trades. So I do believe that it's quite important to benchmark your rates, your ocean freight rates. Nevertheless, we shouldn't forget that ocean transportation rate is not only about ocean freight. There's a lot of uh, costs that has been hidden or that has never been negotiated, but that uh, can at the end of the year, represent a huge amount of money. And I'm going to talk about detention in the mirage, which is basically the number of days that you keep the containers before giving it back, and the storage costs at the terminal, which is basically a kind of fee that you pay to the terminal to park your containers. And eventually, with what happened on the market, there has been a huge amount of containers that have been stuck in the terminal and a huge number of containers that has been kept by the BCO. So my advice is for every company, and I'm sure that they have been suffering for this cost, is to negotiate as well this kind of cost. And usually this can be negotiated directly with the carriers or the NVOCC if it's detention and demurrage or it can be also negotiated directly with the port terminal when talking about storage. And there are some standards on the market that are uh, free source. So you can check sometimes on the website. So make sure that at least you get the standard of the market or that you know what is your needs so that you can negotiate it. Because I can tell you Radu, I have been monitoring those costs for the past seven years and the increase is insane. So there's a lot of costs that are coming from those detention and demurrage. So my advice is start to look at it, guys, to know very well what you need to monitor so that you can adapt exactly what you will negotiate as per your need. Sammy, can, maybe can if I... I, if that, I Rod, you... Sorry, Hannah. Please go, please go. Sure, sure. Now, I just wanted to pick up on a few points that were mentioned there. You know, first, I think... Um, Let's comment on Sami's point about the uh, detention, demorage, and the cost, right? I think last year has been a very, very extraordinary year. It's not just um, COVID, but I think even in terms of freight rates, I think Dell or uh, Decathlon would be able to attest to that, has also gone up very, very high, right? It's, a, it's really very much a function, I believe, of demand and supply, right? The rebound was so quick that the industry was struggling with capacity, both in terms of ships as well as containers, right? In our uh, um, discussions with our customers, not just the carriers, but also BCOs and forwarders, we find a very enduring formula 
in arranging and in, in coming up with a beneficial solution for all parties will be really to work very closely together. So, um, for example, you know, one is in terms of digitalization, right? Heine is right in that the quality is poor, right? Even within a certain, certain locale or context, it's very hard to get standards in terms of quality. So we will work through with the suppliers and customers on how do we want to define, you know, certain standards? How do we work towards uh, targets that you wish to strive for? And on our platform, we'll see what you're really achieving so that you could plan in advance. But even after saying that, you know, once we have that data, then we could be more prepared to make intervention measures. Okay, for example, you know, if we know that we are expecting a lot, a big lot of shipment to be discharged, it's always in the terminal operator's interest to get it out quickly, right? Does it help if I could work with some of the trucking community to see, hey, you know, although my ship uh, I will only publish where the boxes will be after the ship has departed my port, which could be one and a half days later, depending on how big that ship is. I could start progressively uh, inform the consignees of when the boxes are arriving so that they could arrange for pickup. We could schedule that very, very closely. So that will also save in terms of detention and demarrage. And it also helps the port operator a lot in relieving the yard. Right, and then and then and, and it just it doesn't stop there because uh, um, we also work with some of these BCOs who tend to hub here, even at the container level. Some of them may want to choose intermodal movement, so some of it could be moving via barge or rail, and we'll work with them closely to see which is the optimal connection to be made. Right? Do I want to go for this rail schedule? Do I want to go for an earlier barge that is going to the neighboring port? So I think there is a lot more room for collaboration to get this going. Yeah, I'll be happy to work with um, Decathlon or Dell on some of these solutions, if I may, to you. I think if I may, uh, Radu, if I may add a couple of, couple of points. Um, one, I think that most shippers are quite good negotiators overall. I mean, maybe you can uh, you can squeeze out another day here or there, but most of the shippers are really, really effective at, at procuring. Um, but but to get more efficiency, it's it's around understanding and having control of what 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 you do. Um, many shippers that I saw, they don't even know how many containers they've stuck in the port, not because the, because the carriers or the port operators are holding them, or right now there's, it's an efficiency and, and, and capacity issue, but the shipper simply doesn't, doesn't know. We've worked with one shipper that had $15 million of detention and demerge of us within a smaller port because they had com completely lost control over their, over their supply chain and, uh, and, uh, and, by providing them visibility and an operating framework of how to improve, they were they were able to save eighty to ninety percent of, the, of those 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 costs. It's about efficiency and effectiveness, and also a big big uh, um, area of improvement that we see is capacity utilization of containers. You know how many shippers are are, are utilizing only sixty percent of the container capacity because they don't have pro effective tools to 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 manage that. Heiner, I really like your comments because I have to tell you that I remember myself when the engine case uh, appeared, we had some containers that were stuck. And that at that time, we didn't have any great TMS. So I remember spending almost one week with spread Excel sheet, trying to figure it out how many mm -hmm. containers I had by asking my 12 different providers. And today, with what happened in the Canal Suez, thanks to the new TMS and the company that we're working with, we were able to get the information within 15 minutes and mm -hmm. to be able to predict also what will be the new time of arrival. So definitely there is a need to have some right and great tools to give the visibility that we require. Otherwise, we can all face the problem that uh, one of your clients have to have mm -hmm. tremendous number of uh, costs without knowing it. Mm -hmm. Yep, <laughs> that that's um, yeah, that's some uh, that's some very good inputs. Thanks for the practical uh, practical examples, and I'll 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 end uh, with with a question. I mean, I'm also on the 
I, I wanted to ask you all on the skills people. Uh, I mean, obviously the teams have been under enormous pressure. All of you, uh, you know, have, have worked uh, overtime, I think, uh, in, in the last couple of months. I wanted also to, to kind of ask, what do you see as, as needed, right, within the, let's say, supply chain or logistics um, uh, contest winner, right, or the logistics professional of the future? What are some of the skills that the there's an increased need hard and soft skills to have in order to be able to keep kind of on top of all these disruptions that may happen continuously. So maybe Gimsu, I'll start with you, you're first on my end, and I'll, I'll ask everybody. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, you know, we, we, we often discuss this as a team, especially for us, we are also going through a, a, a new transformation journey. So, you know, my colleagues would like to put it that, you know, the supply chain managing a supply chain, um, is an art as much as it's a science, right? An art for agility, resilience, and teamwork. Yeah, but personally, my experience would be, I think if we want to talk about really boiling it down to the, the, the necessary skills to run it, right? I mean, as you can see in this discussion, there are procurements, there's supply chains, there's digital. So I would say one of the most important thing is really to relearn, unlearn what you have, relearn and to adapt. Yeah, I, I find that nowadays when I have to sit across the table to recruit, I'm like trying to recruit someone who can run, fly and swim at the same time. <laughs> right, you, you have to be pretty multi-skilled, right? Or if not, you must be able to really connect, you know, if it is a digital uh, um, project, you have to understand, you know, what is the impact of the digitalization, if it's supply chains, if it's sustainability, what are all the various factors coming together? Yeah, so I would say be really agile and nimble in the learning. Mm. Heiner? Um, it's an excellent, excellent question, Radu. In, in, in my view, um, the supply chain professional of the future needs to have the capacity to understand a whole system, um, to understand um, the game and not just the place. Many of the supply chain professionals, both on the service provider side and on the shipper side, are love solving problems, love being the hero of the moment and so forth. The supply chain uh, professional of the future knows how to set up systems, know, knows how to prevent fires, you know, just firefighter, uh, uh, fight fire, so to, so, so, so to speak. In terms of concrete skills, I think engineering skills are absolutely critical and, and, and data science skills are absolutely critical as well. Not just uh, or not only in overall understanding what supply chain and logistic uh, looks like in the real world. Thank you. Rob? Um, so I, I'll give it kind of two parts is... Um, uh, at Dell in the, in the supply chain, we, we have these tenants that we, we talk about. And um, through the this whole pandemic and everything, it's what we emphasize. So it's not necessarily skills, but you get asked all the questions. I get asked all the time, you know, and I'll share, share them with you. Is one is, do you, do you have a sense of urgency, um, right? Uh, are, you, are you being uh, proactive and looking around corners? Um, are you at the right attention to, to level of detail that we have. Um, are you um, holding others accountable? I think I, I think that's, is that the five, I think? Uh, I think if I was to rattle them off. Um, oh, and raise issues up early. So what that, that, that means is basically go tell on yourself or uh, make sure everyone's aware that if I got a problem, where, where is it? And because we really pushed these, these tenants pretty, pretty heavy, um, I think that's part of our culture where we get everyone rallying in the right way to, to get on the Dell team. The other thing I was listening to when, when uh, I think it was uh, Heiner was talking was um, when we talked about the supply chain and, and some of that, the, this new thing that we, we kind of are, um, we're really talking about is if, if it's not broke, break it. Um, something we learned during the pandemic because we did have a lot of issues um, in various different places, but frankly, when when we did have something went wrong or we had to, it actually caused an opportunity to where we might have relocated or redesigned a particular part of the supply chain now, and it's more efficient. It costs less. Um, we now may have better accuracy because of 
some changes that um, we hadn't necessarily, it, it was working, so we didn't change it before. Um, we're seeing that in some pockets. Obviously, this is a, like in a controlled cases where um, we're not doing that in every case, but um, we're, we take, take some projects like that and kind of really test it to see if we can't make something better that's, that's already working well. Super. Sammy, no pressure, you're the last, so. <laughs> no worries. No, I think I, I won't uh, focus on skills, but I will rather focus on human values. And those values are personal value that I do share and that are also uh, explained to every newcomer that enter into Decathlon so that we have actually four values. The first one is the vitality. So it's all about being alive, being full of energy, uh, I dare, I take initiative. So this is one of, of the first value. The second value that I believe is very strong is the responsibility. It's all about being accountable for what you do. I, I, I clearly say what I do and I try to do it as much as I can. The third value is the generosity. It's all about being uh, things done from the heart and being focusing on the others. And I do believe that as Gim was saying before, we need much more collaboration between all the stakeholders. And there is this value, which is very strong because we are saying in Decathlon that we should consider all the stakeholders as friends. So imagine that the carrier, the fruit for waters, the production uh, uh, suppliers working with, we need to consider them as friends. Otherwise, there is nothing that is built. There is no partnership. And this is why we really believe in generosity. And the last one is the authenticity. It's all about being myself, which means that Sami outside Decathlon or Sami inside Decathlon is the same person. And I think this is something that is making also your work and your life even more stable and balanced. I have to be the courage of being myself. I say things simply and I, and I act. So th those are the four values that we do have in Decathlon. And I personally really trust into this value. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, well put. Well, on that note, I want to thank everybody for your time, for your contribution, for the many, many great examples and, and, and sharing and lessons and, uh, and, um, and um, you know, great information. And uh, stay healthy. Great to have had you all. And uh, keep, uh, keep rocking because for sure disruptions will come again and again and again.